This is a comparison of three skulls of modern and archaic human skulls. So first up, I'm going to show you a modern human skull. I should mention that all of these are casts of the originals with some reconstruction work going into them. Um, I'm just going to move quickly through this because um, I suppose the, the interesting parts are really in the comparisons. So this is a side profile. Okay, next we're going to move to a Cro-Magnon skull. Now, the Cro-Magnons were classically described as early modern humans, and now they're used to denote early modern humans in Europe. Uh, the first radiocarbon dating is about 35,000 years ago. This specimen is estimated to be between 10 and 30,000 years ago and was recovered from a gravel pit. The age has been determined from the associated animal findings. Unfortunately, a number of the upper teeth are missing. Let's bring back the modern human skull. Now, the Cro-Magnon skull looks a little bit shorter vertically but that's because of the collapse due to the loss of the teeth if you notice on the right hand side the, the chin is very prominent on the Cro-Magnon specimen the orbital region um, the eye sockets in other words in the Cro-Magnon specimen appear slightly larger than the modern human. If you also look here, you see the orbital, supraorbital ridge is quite pronounced. There's a little bit of a, a brow there compared to the modern human. So now what I'm going to do is bring up Another specimen, this time a classic Neanderthal. Okay, so almost immediately this specimen is looking quite different to the other two. Um, let's bring up a modern human for comparison. Now, I suppose if you just look directly at uh, the skulls um, face on, what you'll notice is that the orbital region, the, the eye sockets in the Neanderthal skull, 
a very large in comparison to the human skull. Also the brow ridge, this, this is really defining the uh, Neanderthals. It's a very pronounced, thick, bony ridge which is completely different from the human skull. You also notice that the uh, the nasal region, the the sinuses, are and the 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 ethmoid plate are obviously missing from the Neanderthal skull, um, possibly due to damage of the original specimen. But what is is fairly evident and is repeated in other findings is that the this nasal opening in the Neanderthals is much much larger than in humans and the idea here was that Neanderthals have just a very large nose that's filled with lots of mucus, uh, mucus to warm the air as it enters, as it breathes through the nose and that would be useful for the environment it was living in because it was freezing cold so this was thought to be a way that the Neanderthals adapted to their environment. Now something that isn't really often commented on, but is fairly obvious if you look at these specimens, is the teeth. So if you look at the human teeth here, we've got all the usual incisors and canines and molars and premolars. And then if we just move this aside and look at the Neanderthal you know what just what is going on here this is just remarkable this Neanderthal specimen has, has basically just looks as though all of the teeth have be, been filed down And just get some indication here. This is this is the human uh, jawbone, the mandible, and this is the Neanderthal. Just give you some comparisons here. What's obvious is that these, in this specimen at least, these Neanderthal teeth are just massive and the, the jawbone is, is just massive in comparison to, to the human uh, one. And what's also very interesting is that these lower teeth at the front, the incisors, are actually aligned at 90 degrees to the human equivalent. Now, I'm not sure if this is just some result of compression of the jawbone over a lengthy period of time but basically it looks as though the Neanderthals have their teeth, the lower teeth, orientated in a completely different direction and they've had them chis chiseled down or filed down, it looks, it looks as though that might have happened. What's also impressive is that the Neanderthal has a full set of teeth
so for the next surprise I think it's useful just to have a look from from the side so what we're going to do is just turn the skulls around and just have a side profile and just examine or compare compare the the brain cases So again, I find this just remarkable. The if we go here from the chin, or rather the where the chin is in humans, because Neanderthals famously don't have a chin. So sorry about that. Um, we go all the way back here to the occipital region, the uh, the very back of the of the skull. We see there's just this massive and. Um, distance, the anterior, posterior uh, distance from the base of the skull and, and the, the vertex through to the uh, tip of the mandible. And what we also see here is this zygomatic arch which is just very thickened compared to <coughs> The human equivalent. Now if we look at the human, modern human, we see a very thin zygomatic arch. We see a very short, more upright skull. So people would think there's there's more frontal lobe development in, in modern humans. But actually when you look at the brain endocast you find that what's happened is it's just it's just the way the Neanderthal brain case is is structured, and to me it looks almost as though in this specimen the Neanderthal is 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 almost protecting its brain case. It's got this what I like to think of as an industrial strength face. This is you know this thickened brow ridge, the thickened psychomatic arch, the thick, chunky mandible, all of these things are just looking as though they're built to protect it. And it's understandable because in that environment, the Neanderthal was up against the cave bear, massive, a massive creature, bigger than current day brown bears. It was up against the saber-toothed tiger, the cave lion, uh, the woolly mammoth, all of these massive creatures, uh, the woolly rhinoceros, um, and it was fighting for its survival. What's also remarkable here is, in this specimen, the brain capacity, the, or the cranial capacity, I should say, sorry, is 1600 cc. You can't directly go from the cranial capacity to the brain volume, um, you have to get an endocast to see what impressions the brain has left on the, on the skull interior of the skull case. But it's a fairly good indicator of, of what the brain volume is likely to be. And here we have a, a modern human, much smaller cranial capacity in comparison. Now, one final comparison I'm going to make is, again, to compare the Cro-Magnon and the modern human from a side profile. So again, it should be fairly obvious when I move this forwards, move this up, that the modern human cranial capacity is, is smaller 
than the Cro-Magnon specimen. And again, what's happened is that you've got a development of, of the Cro-Magnon skull posteriorly, so it's, it's moving further back um, than the modern human skull. And again, if we just look from this angle, we're seeing something quite interesting. There, this difference in cranial capacity becomes quite obvious. And you'll notice also that there are some interesting differences in, in the sutures, although I'm not sure how accurate these are in the reproduction, um, although I, I would imagine they're fairly accurate. But in the modern human skull, you've got fairly straight, few kind of curves, or sinus waves I like to think of them as, whereas in the Cro-Magnon specimen you have a big squiggly line uh, moving all the way through, uh, separating the different um, plates, cranial plates. Now this is a comparison of the modern human with a Neanderthal skull and this Neanderthal skull just goes back and back and just kind of expands out at the back which is quite incredible really. The, I mean it's fairly obvious, there's an almost egg shape uh, to, to the human skull from this angle. But here what we have is it's filling out towards the towards the back. Now this filling out I think is quite interesting because it looks to be the area where the temporal lobe joins to the occipital cortex. In other words, this is the area where the region of the brain which is related to memory is impacting on the occipital cortex, the part of the brain that's related to vision. And this is a characteristic of the late Pleistocene Neanderthals and also, funnily enough, of some of the Cro-Magnon specimens from that period of time. So they almost seem to be following each other in, in adaptation terms. The question is, what would the endocast look like at this point? What changes would this actually make to the brain? Is, is this really meaning that the Neanderthal brain is expanding out in the vision part of the brain? Um, and similarly for the Cro-Magnon. So, uh, this, the similar shape of late Pleistocene Cro-Magnon skulls suggests, to me at least, that there must have been some interbreeding going on through that time. So I'm just going to just give one final run through, so that's the Neanderthal. That's the modern human. And that's the Cro-Magnon. 
And what I'm really thinking here is that the Cro-Magnon is looking more like the Neanderthal in terms of the extension of the occipital parts of the skull compared to modern humans where really this shape is just being lost and this would kind of make sense in terms of a um, hybridization between early humans leaving Africa and Neanderthals as they move up through the Middle East and into Europe where these places are just completely dominated by by Homo neanderthalensis. I mean these uh, early humans are just coming into into Eurasia, an area just completely dominated first of all by Homo erectus and then by Homo heidelbergensis and then completely dominated by Homo neanderthalensis. So what seems to be happening perhaps is that the human brain skull is is moving back into into the direction it was originally um, going in the trajectory before meeting with these archaic humans okay thank you I would just like to add that really you can't make these kind of comparisons very uh, solidly using single specimens so I've been slightly naughty here giving these examples because what you need to do is, is look at the population averages but what I hope to demonstrate here is that even when you've got large variation within populations when you take a human skull and you compare it with a, a Neanderthal skull we're looking at, at two distinct adaptations to, to the environment with, uh, 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 with the gestalt, that's the entire picture taking into account all of the tiny variations making a significant difference in the whole 